So it's my pleasure to present Johannes Feist. Uh, so Johannes have done the PhD at uh, Vienna, at the group of Joachim Burdofer. And then he moved to Harvard to work with uh, Misha Lukin. And after his first postdoc, he come back to, he come back, no, he, he came to Madrid uh, to work with Francisco Jose Garcia Vidal. And uh, I think it was in 2017, you got an ERC, starting grant, to work in uh, polaritonic chemistry. And Johannes uh, have done a lot of uh, seminal uh, works um, in polaritonic chemistry. And he's going to tell us about how we can use cavities to modify material properties. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Rui, for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's nice to be here. We're really close, but I only very rarely come to ETHMM, so it's nice to be here. And I want to, in some sense, start by apologizing because I'm going to give a kind of very broad talk and not go into a lot of detail. I don't usually like that style of talk too much, uh, but since we are close and people might be interested in collaborating and so on. I thought it would be good to give kind of an overview of a quite a few things that we have done and not just focus on a single topic. Uh, yeah, so overall kind of the things I'm going to discuss is how to uh, use cavities to modify material properties. And we're going to start with an outline discussing a bit strong light matter coupling and polaritons and then uh, go into a few more topics in a bit more detail. So, kind of as a general introduction on our idea, kind of, um, the group where we started working on this comes from nanophotonics, and traditionally there the idea is that we want to use materials and tailor materials to control the flow of light. But now there's this kind of new idea already for um, a bit of more than a decade or so, I would say, that asks the question if we can actually use the light, and in some sense, more precisely, the vacuum field, to actually modify material properties, where material properties should be understood in a very kind of wide sense. And the basic concept is that we want to use cavities, basically mirrors or plasmonic resonators or something like that, to modify the electromagnetic environment, which is the same as saying we modify the vacuum fluctuations. And that can lead to effects such as strong coupling or polariton formation and then change the physics that we see. And these kinds of ideas have led to lots of new fields of research, combining expertise really from very different uh, fields and kind of have become a very exciting topic of research over the last years. So to give an even more basic uh, way to think about this, kind of I think everyone of course is familiar with, we often use lasers to modify materials and what we are then doing there is really using many coherent photons that work together to give a significant effect. And the alternative, in some sense, is to say, instead of taking many photons, I want to make sure that the interaction of each single photon with my system is strong, and I can reach that, or I can achieve that, by confining the photons. And the basic effect that we're going to use is really what you learn in second-year physics, uh, just normal mode coupling. So if I couple two oscillators, I get new modes, in this case, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric oscillation that have different frequencies, so they're not the same modes as if each oscillator was there by itself. And the strong light matter coupling is really the same idea, but instead of using pendulums, we use exactly a photon in the cavity and some kind of charge oscillations in matter. And if you couple these two together and you get these two new uh, normal modes, uh, these are actually mixtures of light and matter excitations. So this is what we call polaritons. And to be a bit more precise, if we look at kind of the simplest model that we can think of to explain this, meaning a single two-level system inside an optical cavity, where we take into account that the cavity actually has leakage through the mirrors or absorption in the mirrors, and the two-level system can also emit light not into just the cavity mode, but into free space. Uh, the system that we have to treat in the simplest approximation, the uh, so-called uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, is then just a Hamiltonian where I have a two-level system, I have a single cavity mode, and I have the coupling between them. And the coupling strength, G here, is just given by 
the field strength of a single photon of this quantized cavity mode times the dipole moment of the emitter. And the field strength of this photon scales inversely with the inverse as case inversely with the square root of the mode volume, so it determines on, it's determined by how tightly I manage to confine the photon. And then we have a few different regimes. If the coupling is weak, meaning that this G is smaller than the relevant decay rates, the effect that I get basically is that I modify the radiative decay rate, which is the so-called Purcell effect. But if I manage to make this coupling stronger than the dissipation rates, what I get is this so-called strong coupling regime, where I get vacuum Rabi oscillations in time, meaning that if my emitter emits a photon into the cavity, it gets reabsorbed rather than just leaving the system. And in terms of energy eigenstates, this is exactly uh, when you get these hybrid light matter states or polaritons that are split by the so-called Rabi splitting, which is exactly the frequency of the Rabi oscillations. And then there's a second effect that is basically what happens when we reach this so-called ultra-strong coupling regime, which uh, occurs when uh, the coupling strength G becomes, in some sense, comparable to the excitation frequencies. Uh, I should, this should be omega zero, sorry. And what I get in that regime is that I actually get ground state modification. So here, in, I wrote it down in lowest order perturbation theory, I basically get a term where I have both an excitation on my emitter and a photon in the cavity. And an interesting point here to make that a lot of people recently have missed when they try to use this is that this is not actually a resonant effect. What shows up here is the sum of the frequencies and not the difference. So here I cannot assume that there's just one important cavity mode as I usually do when I have something resonant like I do for the strong coupling. But we'll come back to that later. Okay, and the regime that actually a lot of the experiments that we are interested in work with is not this regime of a single emitter coupling to the light field, but the so-called collective strong coupling regime where I have many emitters inside the cavity mode. And ha what happens then is that the Rabi frequency gets enhanced through a collective effect with the square root of n, with the square root of the number of emitters. And if I remember that the single molecule or single emitter Rabi splitting actually scales inversely with the square root of the mode volume, which is essentially the volume of my system, uh, what this turns out to be is that in the end, the Rabi splitting in this collective regime is determined by the number of emitters per volume, which is just the density times the dipole moment. And in this regime, an important point to understand is that these polaritons really become collective uh, excitations that where the excitation is coherently distributed over all of the emitters. So it's really not the same as a single emitter excitation. And in the energy picture, again, in the simplest model, where I have just a single cavity mode, but now n emitters, what I get is not just the lower polariton and an upper polariton, but now also n minus one so-called dark states that do not couple to the light field, which are exactly all the superpositions where the uh, uh, collective uh, effect cancels out. And there are actually n minus one of them and just one that couples to the light field and gives me the two polaritons. Okay, so as we said, uh, this overall coupling strength, the Rabi splitting, depends on the density of emitters and on the dipole moment. And it turns out that organic molecules actually very nice systems for reaching this strong coupling regime because they have exactly large dipole moments and they can be packed quite densely. I can make a solid where I have really a lot of uh, organic molecules. So the Rabi splitting that has been reached in this kind of system is even more than one electron volt compared to transition frequencies of two or three electron volts in the optical. So I'm really getting ultra strong coupling and I'm reaching a large fraction of the transition energy. This also means that I can work at room temperature, which is roughly 25 mil electron volts, right? So basically my energy scales are much larger than that. I don't need to cool down the system to see this. This is also partially because the excitons in organic molecules are tightly bound. They don't break apart at room temperature. So I can really work with that. And the second effect of this is that it really works with very bad cavities. I can do have cavities with a Q factor of 10 or so, which means that they decay within femtoseconds. I don't need to have a super good cavity, and that means I can work with a lot of different photonic systems to reach a strong coupling regime. So the kind of canonical example are, of course, fabri perot micro cavities, uh, where it's just two mirrors, and in that case, I get, since I have translational invariance, uh, the in-plane momentum is a conserved quantum number, and this is 
as a function of the in-plane momentum, I get a dispersion of the cavity mode, this is typical quadratic dispersion, and then I get the two polariton branches, the lower polariton and the upper polariton. And I can do the same, for example, with these propagating surface plasmons, which are electromagnetic waves exponentially bound to a metal dielectric interface, and I can get strong coupling. And I can even go into this regime of extremely tightly sub-wavelength resonators, typically plasmonic resonators, which means that I have, again, electrons oscillating around in the material and giving me a very strong field confinement. And with these systems, you can reach even the single, mole uh, the single molecule strong coupling regime. So, uh, in the end, kind of based on these different coupling regimes, strong and ultra-strong coupling, there are also two different ideas of what you can do to uh, modify material properties, or two different flavors, if you want. And the, the one that has been mostly used up to now is to, to modify excited state properties. So there's lots of experiments with that. Uh, sure. Uh -huh. Of the surface plasma? No, it's really, it's just the propagating modes. So it's a continuum. Well, the plasmons are themselves hybrid light matter excitations, if you want. Uh, you need to take retardation into account. It's important. So usually it's easier to do it with classical electromagnetism because it's really surface plasma polaritons. So if you don't have retardation, you don't get the uh, mode dispersion correctly. Uh, usually you don't have uh, propagation of the electromagnetic field there, so you don't have the re retardation. So, I mean, the plasmon, yes, but not the plasmon polariton, the surface plasmon polariton, which is a mixture, again, there, kind of, there the photonic mode itself is a polariton that is a mixture of the plasmon of the metal with the light propagating along the surface. So I don't think, we, uh, in these in this tiny systems, absolutely, there I just need Coulomb interactions I can do, uh, DFT or whatever, and I get it basically right. And people have done this. In the large propagating one, I don't think it would uh, work without doing a bit more. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, kind of what is, uh, has been done a lot, and what I will mostly talk about, is exactly to use this, this setup where the cavity mode is resonant with the excitations in the material that I want to modify, which gives me strong coupling and polaritons. And then what I use in general is that the polaritons are hybrid light matter particles, quasi-particles, and so they inherit some properties from the light and some properties from the metal. And that gives me, for example, the opportunity to do exciton polariton condensation because polaritons interact with each other because they have a meta component and meta excitations interact with each other, whereas light itself doesn't. And so they can condense and you get basically Bose-Einstein condensation. It allows me to look at transport where I use that the polaritons, since they have light character propagate over much longer distances than excitons that have to hop kind of from molecule to molecule, and I can look at things like trying to modify photochemistry. And then the other uh, direction that people have started to look at recently, and what is mostly theory, is the idea to modify low energy properties in some sense, meaning uh, properties of the material that are much lower energy than the photonic modes that I'm using. And this is, for example, if I want to modify superconductivity, ferromagnetism, etc., or ground states. And then I don't need this uh, resonant condition, and I'm not using it, which also means that, as I mentioned before, I shouldn't really use only a single mode, because all the modes will play a role. And this is kind of the same effect as ultra-strong coupling, and it's very closely related to a huge amount of work that has been done on Casimir and Casimir border forces, uh, although not with the same kind of uh, final goal. Okay, so what we will focus on mostly now is this uh, excited state properties and just some very simple examples of what you can do with this. Let's say the most, in some sense, trivial example is just to say what I can do is modify where some given material, in this case molecule, absorbs light. 
It's just because I get the Rabi splitting. It may sound trivial, but can be interesting. For example, if I can make a molecule that has nice uh, properties for uh, solar light absorption, but doesn't absorb at the frequency that I want, then I can use strong coupling to move the absorption spectrum. For example, this is this collaboration we had with a group in Gothenburg recently. Another kind of maybe a bit more interesting example from the topic of uh, physics is uh, Bose-Einstein condensation or polariton lasing as it's also called where I use exactly this that the polaritons inherit properties from both the photons and from the excitons and uh, for exactly the interactions and then they can for example collapse to the ground state of the system if I pump it hard enough and if I manage to accumulate enough polaritons they can at some point uh, collapse into a single state and I get condensation. And uh, another topic that we have also worked on for a while is, and that I will talk about in a bit more detail later on, is long-range energy, energy transport, where the simple idea is to exactly this, that the polaritons are coherent, delocalized states, and therefore uh, transport energy over much longer distances than if I have to hop from molecule to molecule. So here we did a very simple model a few years ago where the excitations without the cavity would have to hop from side to side and inside the cavity uh, they can go basically directly from one side to the other and you get this enhancement of the transport by like seven orders of magnitude for this model for example and a uh, closely related uh, experiment that showed for example a long range polariton propagation over distances of 40 micrometer or even more whereas typically excitons in the molecular material itself would hop a few nanometers or tens of nanometers. Okay, so with that I'm finished basically with the introduction and I'm going to go into a bit more detail on uh, these collective molecular polaritonic approaches. And one of the main topics that we have really worked on is to take into account that molecules are really not two-level systems, right? They have this, for example, in the so-called Diablonsky diagram, they have all of these different uh, states, singlets, triplets, vibrational sublevels. Uh, they have internal conversion, they have vibrational relaxation, they have intersystem crossing. So a lot of things happen in a molecule that are not just a two-level system. You also see it if you just look at the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum. They're really shifted to each other. They have structure, they're very broad. Or maybe a more visual uh, picture of seeing this is if I look kind of at, at these typical molecular dynamic simulations where I see that the molecules are moving around all the time. So what I really have is many nuclear raw vibrational degrees of freedom that are normally quite strongly coupled to the electronic excitation that then couples to my light. So when the nuclei move around they change the energy of the excitation and these dynamics are typically quite fast on the order of femtoseconds which is also roughly the order of the Rabi oscillations and of the lifetimes in these kinds of systems. So we have kind of lots of uh, things happening at roughly the same time scale. So it also kind of makes it very hard to, to do this, but presents an opportunity to kind of really affect the dynamics because I'm working on their natural time scale in some sense. And one of the first uh, demonstrations, experimental demonstration that you can really do kind of somewhat unexpected things was this uh, demonstration of a change of the photochemical reaction rate in a cavity by the group of Thomas Everson, by now more than 10 years ago, where they showed that this uh, photochemical reaction where one form of a molecule, so-called spiropyran, after excitation uh, switches to this merocyanin form. And what they found that is that inside the cavity, the rate of this reaction really changed from being outside the cavity. And so we worked uh, quite a bit on trying to understand how we can actually understand what's going on there. And uh, basically the method that we worked out and that is now used in a lot of works in this field is the so-called description on polaritonic potential energy surfaces, where basically the idea is that instead of just treating a single two-level system, I still I use the von Oppenheimer approximation that we always use for molecules, but I take into account the cavity as well, and what this gives me is that now my, mo my molecular potential energy surfaces here for a very simple model become polaritonic potential energy surfaces. And here, depending then on the position of the nuclear coordinate, 
my state is either more photon-like, the excitation, or more uh, exciton-like, or where it's kind of here in the kind of white, it's really a polariton, where it's a superposition of the two. And so with that, kind of you can understand why in such a strongly coupled system, the dynamics of the molecules are really quite different than outside. Although, of course, then afterwards, there's a lot of details and it's not always so simple. But this is kind of the general idea and we showed that you can, for example, suppress photochemical reactions. We showed that you can photoprotect uh, an RNA base, uracil. Or, for example, with Rui a few years ago, we showed that if I now put this into a plasmonic cavity, these polaritonic potential energy surfaces give me fast oscillation. And the ultra-fast emission, because of the short lifetime of the plasmons, actually allows me to see the wave packet motion in the molecule, where usually I would have to use some kind of pump probe setup. And in this case, I don't need to do that, because basically the ultra-fast emission works as a probe process. So I can just send a single pulse and then see uh, the time-resolved emission. Okay, another kind of big topic over the last years has been to understand how energy is transferred in these collective systems between the polaritons and uh, specifically what turns out to be really dominant is these dark states or exciton reservoirs they're sometimes called and uh, one of the kind of challenges that the field is facing currently is that in general what you typically find is this so-called large n problem so the overall problem is basically that you have many more dark states, these n minus 1 dark states that I mentioned before, than polaritons, and the excitations tend to get stuck there. And those dark states are essentially bare molecules, and so if you really want to change the, the dynamics or the properties of the material, you have to uh, somehow overcome this problem. You have to design it in such a way that you don't have this. And uh, this was actually an experiment where we just kind of uh, Carl Berriusson in, in Gothenburg wanted to say, uh, to demonstrate that what the theorists say, how this should behave, actually happens in experiment because no one had done it explicitly. And basically what they did is design different cavities where everything stays the same apart from the number of molecules and then see if you have this problem of scaling with 1 over n for the rate of any process going from the dark states, from the reservoir, to the polaritons, which is this slow suppression by 1 over n. And just to give an idea, this n in typical uh, optical systems is on the order of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. So it's really a significant suppression. And uh, therefore it's, it's a kind of a problem that has to be dealt with if you want to do something. Another work that we did recently is to show that I can really act, I can use these polaritons to actively uh, change energy transfer between donor and, and acceptor species. So in, in, kind of in photophysics or photochemistry, uh, you often want to kind of transfer energy from one species, in this case, is this uh, SP, spiropyran, to uh, a different one which was this so-called BRK molecule. And what we showed in this paper is actually that this is the same molecule that uh, where we showed that where the experimentalists in, in Strasbourg showed the photochemistry change. And here we showed that we can turn on energy transfer through the polaritons and turn it off by doing a photochemical reaction. So we can use a photochemical reaction and then the cavity to really modify and tune kind of actively uh, on a scale of a few uh, minutes in this case, the energy transfer between the molecule states. And another uh, kind of topic that we have worked on for a while now is long-range energy transport, so basically polariton dynamics, where if I say, if I now really start a polaritonic wave packet, so this is an experiment done by Tal Schwartz in Israel, uh, where they send in a laser pulse, uh, sorry, here the pump, and then generate a wave packet in the polaritons and then see how it propagates over time with the propulse. And what they found is that really depending on where in energy, what changes in these different lines, is where in energy they pump the system, they get propagation that either looks ballistic, which is in this logarithmic scale a slope 2, which basically means quadratic uh, change in the position. So this shows how over time how far 
the wave packet has moved essentially and they see really this crossover for some energies from ballistic to diffusive motion and that some energies it's directly diffusive and as other experimentalists who only found the ballistic one or only found the dispersive one and it was kind of not fully clear what's going on with all of this and here in a collaboration with Gerrit Grönhoff in, in uh, Uvescula in Finland what we did is uh, molecular dynamic simulations where we really have the full molecular details with the semi-classical description inside the cavity to uh, try to understand what is going on. So uh, we did this for this Fabry Perot cavity where again the dispersion is this quadratic dispersion for the cavity mode and then you get under strong coupling the lower polariton and the upper polariton branch and by doing then wave packet simulations for example like this where we show the position of the wave packet uh, as a function of position and time and here this is the full one, this is the excitonic part, this is the photonic part uh, you see already that you have some part that is propagating with a given speed which is basically the dispersion like the group velocity of the polaritons according to the uh, dispersion relation and then you have a part that seems to kind of get stuck and not propagate at all anymore and by looking in a bit more detail uh, well, for example, again, looking at the propagation distance of these molecules, we see that we also find these two regimes when the beginning it's ballistic, this is quadratic, and then it becomes linear. Here the second case is if you include losses and you actually also see a contraction, which is basically because the fast propagating part decays very fast because it has a lot of photonic component, but you get overall the same behavior where you get first uh, ballistic behavior and then at some point the linear one. And what we found by looking in more details is that we really have reversible energy transfer between the polaritons and the dark states. And the dark states, again, since they're basically molecular states, they don't propagate. So since the energy then ends up being transferred from polariton to dark state and back, when it's in the polariton, it moves. When it's in the dark state, it stops. So in the end, the overall behavior, once you're in this regime, is uh, diffusive turns out to be diffusive, whereas the ballistic one is what you find at the beginning when you start in the nice polariton wave packet. So dark states are always the upper and the lower. Yes, they're basically at the energy of the bare molecular excitation here. Not enough, that's basically the problem. That the, the molecules are actually quite broad, so there's, they are so sufficiently overlapping that you actually get sufficient energy transfer quite efficient energy transfer between them. And that's actually the explanation uh, for these different behaviors that you see because depending on kind of if you're here where you're more separated from the molecules, you're more ballistic. If you're here, you're more diffusive and so on. So this explains exactly uh, why you get these different behaviors depending on where you pump. Okay, then the second uh, uh, the second part within this excited state uh, systems that we have been looking at quite a lot actually is the single molecule polaritonics case which is in some sense the same as saying we want to look at sub-wavelength cavity QED because we need in this case uh, cavities or what we call cavities that have really mode volumes far below the uh, wavelengths cubed of the of the frequency of light that we want to use because otherwise we cannot reach strong enough coupling to be in the single a molecule strong coupling regime. And then a big topic that we have been working on that we'll actually talk about mostly is in this case how do I actually map kind of a nanophotonic description of these now much more complex photonic systems to a quantum optics description where I want to describe the system in terms of just a few quantized modes like I do in cavity QED. So just to give a quick overview this as I said, what we use for the sub-wavelength systems to get this extreme wave co uh, mode confinement are plasmonic and also hybrid cavities, which are a combination of plasmonic and optical modes, uh, where we find uh, strongly sub-wavelength field confinement on the order of up to 10 to the minus 7 uh, lambda cubed, so really much, much smaller than you would in free space be able to confine a photon and this enhances the, the light-matter interaction enormously exactly because of this factor of 1 over square root of V in the interaction. And the physical reason why this works is that because what I'm actually coupling to is 
as you mentioned, not really light. It's actually electron oscillations in the material. But the electrons, kind of the system is still microscopic enough that I can understand it with the same tools, so I can treat it with the same tools of classical electromagnetism. And the advantage of this is that it avoids this large end problem and it maximizes local changes. And then it also opens up kind of lots of new opportunities, for example, in nonlinear optics, where a lot of people have been working on molecular optomechanics, basically t realizing that vibrations also couple to the light, and that's in the end the same as the normal optomechanics where big mirrors move just on a much smaller scale. And for example, a recent, actually these two recent papers showed very efficient frequency up conversion from the infrared to the visible by using a system like this. And for us, the main, pro the main questions over the last few years that we have been working in is really how can we understand quantum light matter interactions in such multi-mode systems? How can we use them then for ultra-fast quantum technologies? Can we actually use them for that? Can we reach something? Can we make kind of single photon sources, nonlinear elements, etc., which a priori you would think these are not necessarily ideal systems for that because they are super lossy. But on the other hand, they're also very fast. Everything happens on femtosecond time scales. So you may be able to kind of beat the losses and get something reasonable. But it's still, I would say, it's not resolved. It's still just an idea. It may be that in the end it's not actually useful. So the way that we have uh, to treat these kind of systems uh, is based on a theoretical framework that has been developed already for many years. This is called macroscopic QED which is based on the idea that we, what we want is kind of a quantized description of light matter interactions in really arbitrary photonic structures. So in order to do that, the first thing we have to think about is what do we actually mean here when we talk about light and matter. So in traditional quantum optics or cavity QED, what we have is basically a cavity mode that is clearly just a propagating electromagnetic field that I put boundary conditions on with the mirror and that gives me discrete modes and then the losses are hopefully small if I have good mirrors, and it's relatively straightforward. But that's not what we want to do. In our case, we have these nanophotonic systems where we have a metal antenna with a scale of like 100 nanometers already below the wavelength with an extremely tiny gap often between two metal surfaces that is then on the order of just one nanometer. And there's actually some indications in the literature that even kind of single atom uh, defects can have significant effects and do some uh, create what people have called these pico cavities. So, what we work on mostly stays in this regime. We don't go to the atomistic limit. Uh, but in any case, what I need to describe then is really that my, my cavity is not just a boundary condition. It's really an integral part of the system that has a lot of dynamics, and actually those dynamics typically dominate. So. Uh, what I get is that what we call the photons, or what we want to use as if it was photons, are, as we already mentioned, really m already mixed light matter interactions, for example, the surface plasmon polaritons. So they're actually mostly electrons moving around in this metal, but it's still a collective response and big enough that it's basically a boson, so I can treat it as if it was a photon. But I also pay the price always that I have very large material losses, so just dissipation inside the metals. And I also get typically quite efficient radiation also in the order of femtoseconds, because if I don't do that, then I just wouldn't see anything ever because uh, the internal losses are on the scale of femtoseconds. So I have to make the radiation losses also that fast in order to see the light coming out. And then I really have to be careful when I do the quantization that I cannot just treat this as a perturbation afterwards. So this, the whole idea of this macroscopic QED approach is to separate my whole system. Here I have like a simple example, a molecule between a bow tie nano antenna, and I want to separate it into the part that is kind of the quantum system that I'm interested in, essentially a collection of charged particles that I can then describe through quantum chemistry or just the two-level model or whatever I want to use. And what I call the cavity actually here now becomes a completely arbitrary material structure where I just assume that it's big enough that I can do a linear uh, electromagnetism, basically microscopic Maxwell's equations, in order to describe its response. 
So it's really described by basically in the end the permittivity as a function of space and frequency and the permeability, which is usually anyway close to one. And then the idea of this macroscopic quantum electrodynamics of how to quantize this is that we use this separation and diagonalize this linear cavity response together with the free space electromagnetic modes. And why can I do that? Because linear response means that it's harmonic oscillator, so I can find a harmonic oscillator model that reproduces Maxwell's equations. And then I know from Maxwell's equations, kind of the macroscopic Maxwell equations, and I know the free space electromagnetic modes are also harmonic oscillators. And uh, I can actually also treat dissipation perfectly well within a harmonic oscillator model by just adding a bath for this uh, material degrees of freedom that is kind of internal harmonic oscillators. So in the end, I just have a huge system of coupled harmonic oscillators. And it turns out that if I write it down in the correct way, I can diagonalize it formally, kind of completely generally, by using that Maxwell's equations are solved by the Green's function. In the sense of solving is a bit of a cheat. I'm just writing down the solution is this, and I call it the Green's function. But it's the Green's function that we used to form electromagnetism. And then quantization is actually uh, kind of straightforward because it's harmonic oscillators. And what I get in the end is what we call the quantized medium-assisted electromagnetic field. So it's just a new collection of harmonic oscillators. And I want to say we have not been involved at all in developing this. This has been developed by many people over the last few decades. We're just now using this in this nanophotonic context. Most of the work here was uh, done in the context of this casimir polda interaction and Casimir interactions. In any case, the final result, now completely generally for any system, is that I can write my Hamiltonian for, the electro for, the, for this medium-assisted field as an infinite sum and integral over harmonic oscillator modes that exist at every point in space and at every frequency, but are bosonic, so they commute with each other. They have this delta r minus r prime, omega minus omega prime. Uh, and the electric field is exactly the only kind of the operator of the electric field is the only place where you see the specific properties of the system show up because it's determined by the Green's function of your electromagnetic system. So this is in principle nice. I can say I've solved the problem, but of course I've written down something where this is a 4D continuum of harmonic oscillators, three in space and one in frequency. I have actually six discrete uh, degrees of freedom as well because these are vectorial operators and then I have electric and magnetic type excitations. So uh, let's say this is a bit too large to treat uh, explicitly in any kind of uh, treatable sense or useful sense. Uh, but what I have is that I find that all the system information is really encoded just here in the Green's function and everything is uh, general. So really now for any system I want to treat, I just have to calculate the classical electromagnetic Green's function and I can do it. And in some sense it's not a surprise that it should be this because we know that any linear system is exactly fully characterized by its Green's function. So what else should show up in some sense? Okay, so now the question we have been looking at is how can we make this framework that is very general actually usable for the kind of applications that we are interested in? So the people that developed this mostly used it in a perturbative fashion where I can then treat everything through kind of integrating out all of these modes and that of course works and gives you in the end kind of nice expressions but we want to actually do quantum optics with this. So the way that we have uh, been working on this is to kind of try to unify these two different ways of thinking of the photons of the electromagnetic fields. The one of traditional quantum optics like you would find in any quantum optics textbook where we want to have a few discrete modes, often actually only one, and use kind of uh, Lindblad terms to describe losses. And then the way that macroscopic QED looks like is much more like this traditional nanophotonics viewpoint where I have continuous modes, I can have light coming in from any direction, I can have light at any frequency, and the Green's ten tensor, Green's function, determines kind of the response of the system. And it turns out the nice way to kind of connect these two way, uh, pictures is by the concept of resonances or to be a bit more precise kind of using the tools and ideas that people have been developing over many years in the theory of open quantum systems. 
So here now we're going to simplify the problem to say if I now just have a single emitter, uh, I can actually do one thing to go from this 4D continuum to a single 1D continuum. I'm not going to go through how to do it, but it turns out this is quite straightforward. And then what you find is that actually the whole information about the interaction between that emitter and the full electromagnetic system is encoded in the single function, the so-called spectral density, J of omega, which is more or less proportional to the local density of states. Also, if you're familiar with the Purcell factor, that tells me how much faster is spontaneous emission at the position I'm interested in compared to free space. And it's given again by a simple expression in terms of the Green's function, specifically the imaginary part of the Green's function. And the spectral density turns out exactly to be the central quantity that we use in open quantum systems to characterize any environment. And any two environments that have the same spectral density, doesn't matter where it comes from, from the viewpoint of the emitter, are exactly the same. So this is what we will use to kind of replace this real electromagnetic environment by a quantum optics model. And this actually, in the simplest case, has been done uh, 30 years ago by now by Atajima Moglu, uh, who showed that if my spectral density corresponds to a Lorentzian, which is exactly the shape that we think of as a resonance, I can replace exactly, so this is not an approximation, this is exact, I can replace this Hamiltonian with a continuum of modes by a Lindbergh master equation with a single mode. So this resonance that I kind of intuitively think of as a single mode, as a mode of the system, actually turns out to be described by a single mode, and it has losses, a Lindblad term, uh, that are given exactly by the line width of this mode, of this Lorentzian. And in principle, if I have multiple lossy modes, I can just do a sum of Lorentzians, meaning then also a sum of modes here, and I can use that to kind of fit any spectral density if I want. And for systems with clean, nicely isolated resonances, this is enough. This is actually one way, if you want, to also derive the quantum optics Hamiltonian in cavities with very sharp resonances. But it's not usually done like this because it's not rest necessary. But for the system that we are interested in, it turns out that Lorentzians, at least isolated Lorentzians, are in some sense not enough. And if we look, for example, at this plasmonic nanogap antenna, you see that these look more or less Lorentzian, but then you get this broad peak with a kind of asymmetric structure, and if you make the square, the, the spheres larger, you actually see that these peaks are not really Lorentzian anymore and so on. And even more if you go into these so-called hybrid cavities, where I put, for example, a plasmonic nanoparticle, in this case a cone, not a sphere, into a mirror, into a, a fabry perot cavity with two mirrors, what I get is the spectral density. Here you should focus on this red line with the black dots on top. I get something that looks kind of like there are peaks, that, that's fine, but it's clearly not just a Lorentzian. It has this kind of Fano line shape with dif destructive interference and then a peak afterwards. Or the same for this example, which is again a plasmonic nanoantenna on top now of a photonic crystal cavity, where the spectral density has this double peak structure with some interference uh, dip in between. So what we find is that the resonances are not necessarily a Lorentzian and we get these interference effects and non-symmetric peaks and then what we try to do is to find an equivalent few mode model where I get a quantum optics description in terms of a few modes but I can represent this kind of cheaply. And it turns out that it's actually a very kind of simple uh, generalization of what we said before. If instead of having just a single mode, I have multiple modes, and now I actually allow them to interact, so it's not just independent Lorentzians, but they're interacting with each other, and they're all coupled to the emitter, I can again find that I can expect, uh, uh, show that this dynamics of this system with just a few discrete modes is exactly equivalent to a system where the spectral density is given by this compact expression, so it's just the inverse of this Hamiltonian containing the energies and couplings between the modes and their losses, and then I just need to invert it and take the imaginary part and I get the spectral density. So what this allows me to do is to now have a system with relatively few parameters described by just a few modes and their interactions that gives me a lot of uh, flexibility to get kind of any spectral density I want, as we painted here in some, uh, sch schematically. 
So all I need to do once I have this nanophotonic spectral density that I calculate from classical electromagnetism is to fit a system like this, to fit the parameters to reproduce the same thing. And this is really the only approximation we have in this method. You would think so, but no, because the losses break this. If I do it, then the losses become you know, off-diagonal. So this is exactly, and this is one of the kind of unexpected things I would say that we found from this, is that in general nanophotonic systems, in some sense, losses and couplings don't necessarily commute, or often do not commute, and this is one of the directions that then we are now exploring, in fact, because this gives you a lot of new freedom that you don't have if you use independent modes. Very good question. So just to show here, we then did a hybrid test system again, in this case a dielectric microsphere with two metal nanoparticles inside. And so the black line here is the classical electromagnetism calculation. This is done with this COMSOL solver package. And uh, now we try to fit it and you see we have all of these uh, of complex interference structures and we find essentially a perfect fit which has 20 modes, which is basically the number of peaks you see here, so you're not going to get away, away with less than that ever. But it's really just 20 modes. And if I try to do, to do the same without allowing interactions, where this blue line is the best fit, I see that kind of the ones that are nicely isolated, maybe I can get, but these interference structures are really not reproduced well. So what this really tells me is exactly what we were saying now. Well, first, that now I have, in some sense, a very simple mapping between nanophotonics and quantum optics based on the spectral density. And that in general, in these systems, exactly the couplings and losses do not commute. I cannot diagonalize the interacting modes without getting off-diagonal Lindler terms. And then that really gives me new physics to play with. And that means, in some sense, that these mode interactions are really an intrinsic feature of nanophotonic systems. And uh, this is one of the directions we've been working on for a while now. Uh, a nice part of this uh, approach is also that I can really get access to the spatially resolved electromagnetic field. So here I'm showing a video of how the electromagnetic field propagates out from this exactly this system under spontaneous emission, where I'm actually in a regime where I have strong coupling. So this is far from what you would get in just a single classical simulation with the dipole because your population goes down and then goes up again and so on. And you really get the full information about the electromagnetic field. I just want to mention quickly that I've talked only about the single emitter case, but it's relatively straightforward to extend it to multiple emitters. And if you work in quantum optics, you might say, well, 20 modes is still way too much to do anything real. But uh, it turns out that if I want to treat resonant uh, dynamics, I can typically pick out just one or two of the modes that are really resonant with my emitter and treat the rest perturbatively after I've done the fit. So that's what we showed here. So, and uh, a nice uh, thing of this, or a nice uh, aspect of this approach is that it also gives really a kind of a new perspective on looking at a lot of the effects in these kinds of systems. For example, for ultra-strong coupling, it has been well known, and there's actually quite a lot of literature on this problem, uh, that if I have an ultra-strongly coupled system, which to remind you is the ones where the ground state really gets modified significantly, I cannot use normal Lindbergh terms in my description because I get artificial pumping from the ground state. So I cannot just say, essentially the point is that the ground state is itself hybrid, contains photon excitations, and if I now have a Lindbergh term that makes photons decay, it makes my ground state decay, but the only way to go is up, so that decay is actually pumping. And that's an artificial and wrong effect. And from the spectral densi uh, density perspective, it's actually easy to understand why this happens, because as we said, a single Lorentzian, uh, a single Lindbergh term actually corresponds to a Lorentzian, and the Lorentzian exists at all frequencies, positive and negative frequencies. Whereas the real spectral density, the photons, only exist at positive frequencies. So the real one should be cut off here at zero frequency and then be zero, but the Lindbergh term that is a single Lorentzian goes to negative ones. And exactly these contributions are what give me this artificial pumping. And it turns out we can actually use our model with these interfering modes to set it up in such a way that the, that the interaction between them makes the negative frequency components interfere 
not exactly to zero, but to a very small level that then doesn't matter anymore. So I can construct here a standard quantum optics model uh, with just a few coupled modes. It turns out that even five works quite a lot better. Even three is not bad. So you cannot do it with one, but it's not many more. And with just Lindler terms, and you reproduce really, and you actually do better than any of the state-of-the-art methods that were in the literature before that. And it's actually numerically much more efficient. So it's, uh, it turned out to have applications kind of in, in not just describing these nanophotonic specific uh, geometries, but also for these kind of general problems in light matter interactions. Another very nice uh, application of these types of ideas that we found is that uh, since the losses are important, it's also kind of natural to then ask, can I use the losses to actually engineer interactions that I want or engineer processes that I want? And we found that we can uh, set up a hybrid system, in this case consisting of a plasmonic nanoparticle exactly in a fabry perot cavity, where I reach a nonlinear response not by nonlinearity in the energies, but in nonlinearity in the losses. So, if I want to do specifically here what we looked at, single photon emission, what I typically need to do, which is a so called emission photon blockade, is to ensure that if my system absorbs one photon then at the frequency omega l, absorbing a second photon is suppressed because I don't have any final state at that frequency anymore. And that then basically means that my system also only ever gets a single excitation and then also emits only a single excitation. But what we found is that if I engineer the system in such a way that instead of detuning in energy, I make a second state that may be resonant but is extremely broad. So it's basically, if you want, detuned in complex energy space. Losses I can think of as the imaginary part of the energy. I can also suppress this emission by a factor that's basically the ratio between the loss rates between the two. And it turns out that exactly in this hybrid system of uh, plasmon and cavity, I can set it up in such a way that I reach this regime and I get extremely efficient uh, single photon emission uh, in this setup. And we are currently uh, talking with some experimentalists who will are trying to see if they can actually implement this, which of course is never as easy as our simple models we would like it to be, let's say. Okay, so if I have a few more minutes, I would very quickly just talk about this uh, second approach of looking at low energy, basically ground state properties. So just to remind you what I mentioned before, there's the second direction of trying to modify ground state properties, where as I said, up to now it's mostly theory, and like ma magnetism, conductivity, superconductivity, etc. And as we said, there the cavity modes are not necessarily resonant with any excitation. So what kind of thing do we want to look at? Exactly now low energy properties and what we want to do in this case is actually uh, kind of integrate out the cavity modes. So here we're going back for now to a very similar to a simple model with a single cavity mode and say how does this cavity mode coupling to the dipoles of this well, now it doesn't have to be two-level systems, just kind of whatever my system is to the dipoles of that system. How does that affect the dynamics of the system? Can it then, for example, induce long-range order, phase transitions, etc.? For now, we're going to have a few. We're going to do a few important assumptions in this work. One is that the emitters do not have to be two-level system. We don't assume anything about them, in fact, uh, but apart from one very important point, that we assume that the internal energies of this low energy Hamiltonian are much smaller than the photon energies that are relevant in the cavity. So that means that there are no important re resonant effects and everything is this kind of off resonant effects. And it turns out that under these assumptions, you can basically integrate out the photon mode. And you can do this by many different ways, this Schiffer-Wolf transformation, you can use path integrals, there's a paper of Hepp and Leap from the 70s, and so on. And what you get is an effective Hamiltonian that is basically the original Hamiltonian of your low energy dynamics minus a sum here over the dipoles with the mode, the electric field of the cavity mode and here divided by omega c. But as we mentioned, this effect really does not depend on resonance. In this case, since I assumed that the frequency of the internal Hamiltonian is kind of low, basically 
I don't have anything here, I just have omega c, otherwise I would have the sum of frequencies. And so what this means is that I really should include all the photon modes. But it turns out that we exactly have the method where I can very easily include all photon modes without knowing anything about it, which is this microscopic QED. And if I do that, I have to go through quite a lot of steps. But in the end, it turns out that I can actually, again, simplify this down to a very, very simple final expression, where I get that my effective Hamiltonian is, again, just the original uh, low energy Hamiltonian, minus this effective interaction between dipoles. But this effective interaction between dipoles is actually trivial. It's the electrostatic response of my system. So if I take into account all of the modes, and I assume that the frequency of my uh, internal dynamics is very low, well, it's actually not that surprising. What I get is basically the electrostatic response. So here we write it in terms of the Green's function, because that's general for any system. Of course, the electrostatic de response depends on what the system is, but it very strongly limits what you can do with the cavity. And there's actually a lot of papers in the literature, unfortunately, that use single mode models that then get kind of awesome, exciting effects that are just artifacts of using a single mode when you really shouldn't. So this is what I was saying, that the single mode models can really give very misleading or wrong results. But it turns out that doesn't mean that you cannot do anything. For example, we looked at here a system that is kind of inspired by an experiment, but not really reproducing it where we looked at a collection of ferromagnetic nanoparticles. So we already assumed that each nanoparticle has a large spin and that these spins are coupled to the phonons. So there is spin-phonon coupling in many uh, materials. And if these phonon modes are infrared active, I then get basically my spins on each particle coupled to a phonon, which I represent as a spring here. And uh, these interact through the photons, through the electrostatic interaction in the end, with each other. And if you work out then the effective interaction that you get, you get this so uh, effective bi-quadratic spin-spin interaction. And this is actually very interesting because usually spin interactions are not quadratic, not bi-quadratic, but bilinear. And it turns out that getting this bi-quadratic interaction where the square of the spin shows up actually promotes a kind of unconventional magnetism that promotes order ordering, meaning the spins order if the interaction is large enough without actually preferring ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic configurations. And it also turns out that in this system, the phase transition of going into this ordered state is actually a first order phase transition, whereas in conventional magnetism it's a second order phase transition. So you can get really kind of interesting effects from this. Okay, and that with that I'm already finished. I want to thank uh, my team, my funding agencies, my collaborators, uh, Francisco, Antonio and Gerrit, and thank you for your attention. One, it, the, your expressions about G, uh, the, uh, J of omega and so on reminds me a lot of the caldera legged model, exactly. which was studied in the 80s in connection with macroscopic quantum phenomena. Maybe you can elaborate on that. And regarding your very last topic, you have mentioned magnetism, but what about superconductivity? What happens when you put a superconductor into a cavity defined by some density of excitation? Yeah, so the first one, yes, absolutely. It's very closely related to these types of models like Caldera Leggett and so on, and kind of all the open quantum systems literature. It's just that the specific form of the spectral density that we look at comes from the electromagnetic system, and then it can be very complex. Like most models in the literature, especially in this kind of theory literature, assume some very generic ohmic spectral density with a cutoff or something like that, and that's not what we have. But the overall description is, is very similar. It's basically the same. It's a bath of harmonic oscillators. Uh, regarding superconductivity, we don't know yet. We haven't done it. It's on the table, but we have not had... Uh, not with this approach, with single modes, but I wouldn't trust them, honestly. So I have a question similar to the second one uh, mm -hmm. from Paco. 
uh, what if you have a non-interacting system and you put it in a cavity? Could you induce attractive interactions that could potentially give you superconducting correlations? Possibly, but it really depends. Kind of, you need that the system does interact with electromagnetic modes strongly enough that you then kind of mediating it through the electromagnetic modes, you get the interaction. So typically, how to say, electrostatic interactions inside a cavity are not that much stronger than outside. So if the system doesn't effectively interact Okay. Directly, I mean, that's why we use this kind of mediated interaction through spin phonon interactions that then the phonons do interact with the electromagnetic field strongly. The direct kind of, if you think of superconductivity, kind of if electrons, they are, I mean, you have the magne they're magnetic dipoles basically, but magnetic interactions are very weak. So that ends up not doing much and the cavity is not going to change it too much. So it's not trivial at least, I would say. That's one of the reasons why we haven't focused on the superconductivity too much recently. Hi, thank you for your talk. So I have a question uh, regarding uh, scanning tunnel and microscopy. So in the last okay. decade, uh, STM nanocavities have been used uh, to probe a lot of stuff like single photon emitters in single molecules. You have okay. observed the uh, final line shapes uh, of the interference of plasmons and excitons. Right. And you can also see the photoluminescence of uh, an individual molecule. So right. from your theoretical perspective, why is that we haven't been able to observe yet uh, Rabi splitting or Rabi oscillations? Mm, that's a very good question. I think it's mostly the fact, I mean, I've not really looked in. I think there are some people who have seen s Rabi oscillations, well, maybe with an AFM tip, not with an STM tip. But basically, I mean, for Rabi oscillations, you really need a well-defined and very small mode volume. And this is not automatic that you get that. So I think that might just be the reason. But I've not looked into it specifically. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, so in your talk, you always assume that you know the spectral density and then you want to build a model that correctly represents this spectral density. Uh, I assume then that uh, usually in experiments, experimentalists know which is the, the spectral density somehow with another methods they are able to prove the cavity or somehow. Uh, do, you, um, do you envision situations in which maybe you want to use the emitter to characterize experimental spectral density? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's not true in general. In fact, one of the problems is kind of we know how to calculate the spectral density from classical electromagnet uh, electromagnetism, but there's a lot of details that are different in each experiment. Like we know we can do a model of what they think they do in the experiment. They put a nanoparticle on top of a surface, and in principle we know the uh, dielectric function of gold and so on, but it depends a lot on what quality is it gold, is it monocrystalline, is it polycrystalline, the nanoparticles, it turns out, actually, when they hit the surface, they deform and so on. And getting that information is far from trivial. So in that sense, uh, one of the points is exactly, as you say, to see if we can extract information of what is the system really from the dynamics of the emitters. It's not straightforward, let's say, but uh, yes, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, it depends, I would say. It really depends on what is the collective yeah. excitation. Right. Yeah, I, I think usually they won't couple that strongly to light. These are not strong dipoles necessarily, but it depends really on each system specifically. I mean, I don't know if I can give any general answer, but a lot of these ones are not extremely active, let's say. And this, if it's kind of, how to say, uh, at low frequencies, usually the coupling to light is weaker because basically the spectral density goes to zero. So for that to be important, you have to kind of really look for it. 